Getting an education is a phenomenal opportunity. You have the chance to be empowered for the rest of your life with intellectual skills and habits of mind. And it's an opportunity that's not going to come so easily again. So take advantage of this opportunity. Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with Bob Zimmer. Bob is president of the University of Chicago. Prior to his appointment as president, he was a University of Chicago faculty member and administrator for more than two decades. As a University of Chicago administrator, he served as chairman of the mathematics department, deputy provost, and vice president for research and for the Argonne National Laboratory. He previously held the title of Max Mason Distinguished Service Professor of Mathematics at Chicago before leaving for Brown University, where he was provost and the Ford Foundation Professor of Mathematics. Bob is the author of four books and more than 80 mathematical research articles. In June 2021, he will transition to a new role as Chancellor of the University of Chicago. Bob, welcome to the podcast. When I set up the Paulson Institute nearly 10 years ago, the main reason I decided to partner with the University of Chicago was because you were leading it. I'm a big admirer. So I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. Now, let's start with your early life and career. Talk a bit about your upbringing. And when you were at New York Stuyvesant High School, did you dream of being a mathematician early on? What attracted you to mathematics? Yeah, well, as you indicated, I grew up in New York City, in fact, in Greenwich Village in the West Village. And I went to the New York City public school system from the first grade onward and then through high school. And I went to Stuyvesant High School in New York. Growing up in the West Village in the 60s, 50s, 60s was an extremely interesting and great experience. It was a time when New York really was a post-immigrant world. And it was just fascinating growing up there then because I felt like I was going to school with everybody. And um, it was fun and it was exciting also. So I went to Stuyvesant and my father was a physician. So I was always interested in, uh, well, maybe I'd be a physician too. So I, I went to school interest thinking I'd be interested in uh, biology. Well, then I started taking more science and bit by bit, my interest drifted from biology to chemistry and then chemistry to physics and um, certainly uh, to mathematics. And I went to college actually thinking I would be a physics major. And I always liked mathematics, but it wasn't really until I was in college and really started taking some more advanced mathematics courses that I felt like I've just got to keep taking mathematics because it's just so terrific a subject. I have to learn all I can about it. So yours was a reverse of mine, right? So I, I loved mathematics and English. And I got to college, I was going to be a double major. And it was only when I got to the advanced mathematics courses that I knew that wasn't for me. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I suddenly had to start trying to memorize some of this theoretical stuff, and it didn't come naturally. So people, you know, you've got to love something, but it's got to be something you know you're going to do really well. And you, yeah. you clearly found that home. Amazing. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to jump from there because a lot happened between, you know, college and where I'm going to start here, but I want to tell you that I admire leaders who transform major organizations or institutions. It's never easy, but it's easier when an institution is broken, right? And exceedingly difficult to transform an institution which is already very strong. And so you, as president of the University of Chicago, you took a top-notch university that was 
very, very well known and recognized for the quality of its research and thought leadership. And so you took something and it wasn't quite as well known for how to apply it to the real world. And I remember laughing about that t-shirt slogan at the University of Chicago, you know, that students sometimes wear where it says, works in practice, but doesn't work in theory. And, uh, you know, that's an oversimplification. But under your leadership, I've seen a whole lot of initiatives aimed at making the University of Chicago scholarship more applicable, accessible to re the real world problems. You know, so you've got a new school of molecular engineering, but then you have a whole series of what I would call labs, you know, Becker Friedman Institute, the Urban Labs, the Urban Education Institute, which take scholarship, but are really aimed at policy solutions so you could work directly with mayors, you know, mayor of Chicago or elsewhere, whether it's dealing with homicides or dealing with pollution issues or whatever. And so with that long introduction, universities are famously difficult to manage. So I want to hear about how you thought about this and your approach to getting things done and talk about, about what's given you most satisfaction as you've done this during your tenure as president. Yeah, well, let me talk about getting things done at universities, and then I'll get to your last question about what gave me satisfaction. So the first thing with respect to getting things done is I think it's very important, particularly at universities, but not exclusively at universities, to be very focused on what is the actual meaning and what are the, what's the value of the institution you're dealing with. Why is it important? What is it offering individuals? What is it offering uh, society? And out of that, be clear about what it is that your values and mission are. And having real clarity around that is very important. Second, I would say that it becomes very important to have some clarity about strategy, which is, okay, you know what your mission is, you know what your values are and the nature of the way you want to fulfill that mission. How is it that you're going to do that in the next step? And at the next step, you find this interesting tension, which is you are both the steward of longstanding, enduring values and, and mission, and it's time to realize those in in new and distinctive ways. And so there's can be a little bit of tension there, but navigating that becomes very important so that one looks to the future while simultaneously holding on to and indeed celebrating the values and accomplishments of the past. Now in looking forward and developing a strategy, I think there are a few key things that we tried to do and needed to do. First, one has to be very honest with oneself. Where are you doing well? Where are you not doing that well? Where can you be doing better? And every institution tells itself stories. Important to know where the stories are true and where maybe they're not so true. <laughs> so eliminating as much as possible this self-deceit that can come with, and again, when you have a great institution, it's easy to think everything is great, but it's rarely the case that everything is great. Some things are great, but not everything. So being honest with yourself about where you're really good, where you can improve and where you need to improve is important. You need to get out of a sense of complacency that, oh, we're so good and that we were great last week. Uh, we're great this week, therefore we'll be great next week not so clear. You may have been great last week, you may be great this week, but if you want to be great next week, you have to work at it. And uh, you have to eliminate self-deceit and you have to eliminate complacency. And you also have to eliminate resignation, which is, well, we can't really do anything difficult or hard or really transforming because you know we haven't been doing that. So eliminating those things and going forward with clarity, honesty, 
confidence, but without being complacent and uh, going forward with the confidence and determination that you can do things is very important. Then of course, you need a team of people who can make it happen. Having a strategy is great. Executing is even greater. And building a team, and that includes the right faculty, the right academic leadership of deans and provosts, and the right administrative team, because all of these have to come together into building something great and getting the right people in these jobs and having them all be working together. And of course, a lot of the job of a leader is ensuring that you have the right people and then getting them lined up and having them communicate and having them be committed and having them be clear about what are we going to get done and let's figure out how to do it. And we've all got our role to play and let's do that. And um, that's a critical thing. So building the right team is just totally essential. And then of course it becomes immensely enjoyable to have this group of fantastic people that you're actually working with and getting great stuff done. And boy, you sure have done it. And it's interesting to me to hear you talk about your principles because they're the same ones I tried to use in business and I've seen other leaders. Because to say, you know, every organization has got to have its core principles, but you have to figure out what's core and then everything else needs to change if necessary, in order to stay current with the world, you know, because you, it, it, there's a constant competition, whether it's in a university or whether it's in a business. And then, you know, it's very interesting. I, I loved your last point about people, because I always said, listen, I've seen all kinds of terrific leaders. They come in different sexes, shapes, forms, different strengths, different weaknesses, but they all have certain things in common. And one of them is they recognize they have to get the right people in the right places to compliment them. And if you don't have that, it doesn't work. But I want to ask you about one thing else before you, you've given us your management principles and the Zimmer management principles, I think are great. You've just gone through them. But the other thing that really hit me about you is the speed with which you execute at the University of Chicago. You know, you execute at business speed, not university speed. I mean, I was shocked, frankly, and, and just pleasantly surprised when I could call you and say, I think we should do this or that with the Institute. Or we, you know, and things that would sometimes take a long time elsewhere, you could, and the people you had around you, get things done. Now, how do you, how do you make that work in a university? Well, I think it's a, it's a question of, one, having the right people. But then it's also setting expectations and not letting people fall into this comfort zone of, well, you know, we're a university, so we don't have to go so fast. And just saying, when are we going to have this done by? When are we going to have this done by? Let's get it done. We're all getting older every day and we want to do lots of stuff. Let's get it done and just keep hammering home on that and of course, the truth is it's fun to get stuff done. So people actually feel good when they're able to move quickly and get things done. But it's a combination, I would say, of both liberating people to move quickly and then insisting that they do once so liberated. Yeah. And I think making it fun because I, I notice that people love working with you and it, it, it's fun, you know, and getting things done and getting relevant things done, things that that make a real difference today. Now, I wanna go back to something else that's distinctive about the University of Chicago. And it always has been, but boy, if you reaffirmed it, and I'd, I'd say doubled down, but I'd say doubled up on it. But the University of Chicago has always been a leader in promoting a culture of free speech and scholarship. So at a time when this is under increasing pressure at so many other institutions of higher learning, You've made this a point of emphasis and celebrated this culture, putting out the Chicago principles, which articulates the university's overreaching commitment to free inquiry, expression, and debate. And I'm going to read one part of the statement. It reads this way. It's not the proper role of the university 
to attempt to shield individuals from ideas and opinions they find unwelcome, disagreeable, or even deeply offensive. Now, when you look at so many prestigious universities, which have a different culture and history, and seem to be moving in the other direction, how realistic would it be to expect a new management team to establish a more open culture? Is this a realistic possibility? What, what, what do you see happening here? Talk a bit about this topic, because I yeah. think it is hugely important. Yeah, so I, I agree. It's a hugely important topic, and it goes to the very core of university and how do you do a good job? This is why I'm so passionate about this. So universities have roughly three missions, which is educating people, transforms their lives, transforms the trajectory of their family, and transforms society. Uh, research and creating ideas that advance knowledge and understanding, but also advance the way technology develops and society works. So the education, the research, and the impact that both of these can have on the world. And if you say, how do we do a good job, right? You can say, well, those are noble missions and they are, but it's possible, you know, given anything, you can do a lousy job or you can do a great job. And I have no interest in doing a lousy job. And to me, the whole issue for universities around free expression and open discourse and comfort with ideas of all sort is exactly do a great job in your education and creating a research environment that's going to produce the most original and impactful research. So this is about how do you fulfill your missions in a great way rather than how are you lousy or mediocre at best? And you want to do this in a great way, you need ongoing intellectual challenge. That's what makes a great research environment and what makes a great and empowering education, ongoing intellectual challenge. And the only way you get that is you put people together and you allow open discourse. In fact, you encourage it. You encourage free expression, challenge, and uh, open argument. Bob, it's interesting. So I had done an earlier podcast with Mitch Daniels, who's the president of Purdue. And when I asked him about this same topic, and he feels the same way you do about it, I said, so how did you move quickly? He said, well, I took a look at it. And I said, if we were to do this at Purdue and write a mission statement, it might take two years for our for our university to do that and write the mission statement and going back and forth between faculty. So I went to the board of directors and said, we could take a long time to do it, but here's University of Chicago statement. And I think it's perfect. And so why do we have to develop our own? Why can't we just adopt, you're the board of trustees right here, the board of governors, you can authorize me to adopt it and we'll put it out. And so your ears would have been burning, as he said. This is about as good as it gets, and we don't have to invent everything here. We can just take something that's really great. And I'm hoping that you will see that as you speak out on it, and you've written op-eds and other things, that this makes it easier and gives cover to other universities to do the things which are politically very difficult to do today. Yeah. Well, there are, uh, I forget the exact number at this point, something like 70 or 80 colleges and universities that have done what Mitch did, which was basically adopted or, or modified. Some wrote their own based on the Chicago principles, but adopted uh, the Chicago principles. And that's, um, you know, that's encouraging, but that, that leaves a lot of places that haven't. And as you say, the pressures on people are pretty intense in other directions. And going back to your question, how easy is it for a new administration to come into a college or university and try to kind of create this culture? I would say it's not simple, but it's possible to make real progress. And it goes very much to this critical issue of what's your mission? What are you trying to accomplish? 
because I've, I've been invited to a lot of places to talk about free expression and open discourse. And sometimes faculty say to me at these other institutions, they say, we're having a lot of trouble with this. We can't figure it out. How did you, how come you could do it at Chicago? And I said, here's what you have to do before you try to figure out free expression. You hand people a diploma every spring. Do you know what that diploma means? You're certifying something. What are you certifying? You're certifying something about their education. Are you just certifying that they took some number of courses and so wrote some papers and took some exams? Or is there something deeper about the education that you deliver as a faculty to your students that you're certifying? And if you know what your diploma means, and then you ask, do we need to have an environment of free expression to fulfill what we say we are certifying? I said, that makes it a lot easier. And I say, that's what we have at Chicago is we believe in a certain type of education. And in order to deliver that education, we need free expression and open discourse. And if people, if you're preparing people to go out in the real world, they're not going to be able to go out in the real world where there's all safe spaces and no trigger words, right? You know, <laughs> and where they might not hear an idea that uh, it's offensive to them. Although I got to tell you, our news media right now, where people can self-select and just talk to other people that, that talk the same way they do, is one of the big problems our society is having. Yes. So, so I really applaud what you're doing. I want to move to a, another topic that you and I have spent some time on. To what extent is the University of Chicago impacted by America's immigration policies? And how should these policies be changed? Yes, yeah, so immigration uh, issues are very important to research universities in this country. And one of the great strengths of the United States has been that we have attracted for a long time some of the most talented people from around the world to come here, work here, study here, help build our universities, help build businesses, uh, help build our society. And uh, we see this in, in the university. Uh, all the time. We see it in academic leadership and we see it in simply the work that people do. And I think if you look at the work that gets done in the universities, whether it's research or education, we benefit enormously from having people, talented people from all over the world participating in this. A lot of the problems we're working on are hard. Some of them are global problems like uh, climate change and, of course, pandemic. These are global problems need to be thought about in a global context. But even beyond just those types of problems where you need the perspective of people from different countries because of the nature of the problem, simply from the sheer talent of the people you can bring together, for all sorts of problems is just a huge advantage to be able to take people from around the world. And just as a simple example, if you look at the academic administrative leadership at the university, there are about 10 people involved in this. So there are three deans, there's the president and provost, there's a deputy provost, there's vice president, uh, three directors of national laboratories, two DOE labs, and one uh, the Marine Biological Lab. If you look at those 10 people, I think only two of them, I mean, I'm one of those two, only two of them were actually born in the United States. Uh, actually three born in the United States, but one of them, their parents were not, they were a little kid of an immigrant family and so on. And so you just see this enormous talent coming to the United States and helping lead uh, science and technology at the University of Chicago. And this gets 
repeated all around the country. And to say nothing of, I think if you look at the Nobel laureates in science awarded to Americans, something like 40% of them were immigrants to the country, were not born in the United States. And so what do we need to do to change our immigration policies to keep our country vital and our universities on the cutting edge? Well, first, we need to not make it difficult for people to come as students and not put them in an odd position where if they're here, they don't know if they can get home. If they go home, they don't know if they can get back. So there's just a lot of difficulty. Some of it, of course, at this moment is due to COVID, but some of it is uh, around immigration. But I would say the one of the single most important things, and this has been talked about for years, but never implemented, is for people who come here and get a PhD, and you can look at this in all fields or particular fields that are particularly critical, uh, like science, or perhaps add in economics to that. But for these people who come here and study and that the country has invested in, already for them to be here is that when they get a PhD, they should get a green card so that they can stay in this country and contribute to the country. And in a way, pay back by helping build the United States, pay back for the opportunity to come here and study at the greatest universities in the world, which is what we have and what we can continue to have as long as we have the greatest people in the world here. But right now, with making it more difficult for people to come and for people to stay, you have a lot of talented people in the world saying, you know what, instead of the United States, maybe I'll go to Canada, maybe I'll go to the UK, maybe I'll go to Australia. And there are other people, other countries who are saying, we can build great universities. And uh, China is building great universities. And um, we need to remain, as a nation, competitive at the highest level in attracting the most talented people from around the world. And it's, it's a critical, it's a huge comparative advantage for us right now. And to throw away this huge advantage in attracting talent is a huge mistake. Yeah, I tell you, it's one that uh, I don't think we can emphasize enough. I just don't think there's just across, you know, society, when you just look at what being a magnet for global talent is meant for America, it's just so sad to see us seeming to turn our back on that today. Now, I'm going to go, you, you mentioned the pandemic earlier, so the pandemic is impacting the University of Chicago. You know, how is it impacting your university? And how are you balancing your education mission with the need to protect the health of students and the university community? Yeah, so as you say, the pandemic's affecting the University of Chicago. It's affecting every university, just it's affecting every organization and really every aspect of our society. And uh, we uh, went to remote classes in the spring. And when it came to the fall, we decided we were going to be open and we were going to invite people back, but we were going to do it in a safe way. And so we worked with the epidemiologists at the medical center, which is, as you know, is directly adjacent to our campus. And they did a, just an absolutely heroic job in working with the administrative leaders who we assigned to take the lead in getting organized around this and went through every aspect of our campus, the classrooms, residence halls, dining halls, libraries, common spaces, and how they should be set up and organized so that we were being responsible for uh, public health issues. And it was an enormous amount of work and um, people from all over the university participated in this. 
again, we had the right people and put them on the task. And uh, the contributions of the medical center and the epidemiologists and the safety people of the medical center were just invaluable for the whole university getting set up to open class. So we've been open for the fall. And uh, what we've seen is we, we're doing a lot of testing. We do have some people who have tested positive uh, for uh, coronavirus. We do have some infections among frontline hospital workers, but uh, the, the medical center has taken enormous precautions with respect to this. So we've told faculty we're not making anybody go into a classroom that they do not feel comfortable in. You can teach remotely. Uh, we have facilities available for teaching in person. They have to be done in new ways. And most of our classes are a hybrid of doing things. Some classes, some work being done in person in class and a lot of it being done uh, remotely. So it's been a challenge. We've got a lot of people working on it. I think we've been doing well. I think the reaction of faculty has mostly been, we're going to give it a go and do this as much as possible. I think uh, a lot of faculty have been surprised at how well they feel they can do teaching courses um, remotely. On the other hand, many of them at the same time feel it's still better in person. And so finding this balance is uh, we're counting on individual faculty to be making a lot of decisions of, as we always do. It's their class and they have to do it in the way that works for them and their students. And we're counting on them to be making these uh, decisions while we have certain parameters. All the classrooms are set up so that their social distancing is possible and in fact mandatory. And uh, their, the density everywhere is way less than usual. And maybe if there's a, uh, something good that will come out of this, when the pandemic's gone, there'll be a different mix of remote and time with students. And I've heard some professors say, gee, maybe when we're doing lectures for big groups, I shouldn't have to do that on, on, on person anyway, if it's a big lecture, and that will give me more time to spend with hands-on experience with students. So, right. right. I think that's absolutely true. And uh, it gives faculty a whole other tool, a whole other arrow in their quiver for, for teaching and figuring out when and how to use it under what circumstances will be a, uh, a great thing. And I think it will create new opportunities and it creates new opportunities for reaching other people as well. And I, I've said to everybody, both uh, academic leaders and administrative leaders, you're gonna have to do things differently during this pandemic, but you're gonna learn something. So keep your eyes open and figure out what you're going to learn and uh, what you're going to learn you can use uh, afterwards in new ways so that we should all be paying attention and keeping our eyes open. And uh, I think we'll, we've learned a lot and I think some of it will absolutely be applicable going forward. So let's finish, Bob, with advice to students, which may be similar, but what are advice you giving to students and young people who are beginning their career in the midst of this pandemic? Yeah, I would say that, you know, I urge them to what I do most of the time, which is getting an education is a phenomenal opportunity. You have the chance to be empowered for the rest of your life with intellectual skills and habits of mind and it's an opportunity that's not going to come so easily again. So take advantage of this opportunity. And then when you think about the future, think about it in an open way. 
that you're going to have opportunity, but be focused, work hard, do not feel entitled as if everybody's just going to give you stuff. Go earn stuff. And I don't, don't mean just go earn a living, but earn your place in the, uh, in the world of work and it will be immensely gratifying to you. But figure out what you want to do and how you can contribute. One of the things I always say to students is that the workforce that you're going to enter has one critical difference from all the time you've been in school. When you've been in school, starting in the first grade, all the way through college or even graduate school, it's so much, your experience has been so much about being judged on what you produce. How did you do on this exam? How good was your paper? It's, it's, it's in essence all about you. And it's not so much a situation where your success depends on other people and other people's success all depends on them, but also on you. And in the workplace, that's totally different. You're, you're working for some organization in which everybody's success ultimately depends on everybody else. And I said, that's a whole new experience. And don't go in expecting just because you do a good job on your own terms that that's enough. You have to be adding value to the whole and getting value from the whole, but you have to be adding value to the whole. And that's how you're going to be judged. And that's okay. It's, it's new, it's different, but it's a new experience that you grow into and, uh, and, learn, and learn now what you can from doing that. And the pandemic will create special problems, but I say in a way there's always special problems. This is the special problem of today and it's real and you have to figure out how to work with that sort of constraint but there's always gonna be some difficulty, always going to be some sort of constraint. So take the pandemic, not just on its own terms, but on how do you, how do you work through particular constraints and continue to contribute to the whole and working through particular constraints of which there will always be some of one form or another. That's a great note to end on. This has been terrific. You know, I, in a different business, I said to people something similar to that when they joined Goldman Sachs. I basically said, you can be the smartest person in the world. You can have the best ideas. But let me tell you, if you go off in your closet and think those great thoughts and write a paper that no one's going to read, it's going to make no difference. So your success is largely going to be determined by how you work with other people, how you sell your ideas, how you get things done. And I tell you, if there's ever someone who's an outstanding academic who has then worked to become a great manager and figure out how to get things done, it's you. So, Bob, thank you very much for being with us today. Well, thank you very much, Hank. I really appreciate the opportunity. It's always great to talk to you under any circumstances. I've always enjoyed it, and I enjoy today, too. So thank you very much. You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.